In this video, we're going to talk about the formal definition of an internal direct product, and we're going to talk about a strategy for identifying internal direct products lurking inside of a group. So first, a definition. Let G be a group. We will say that G contains an internal direct product H cross K. So let's underline that internal direct product H cross K if H and K are subgroups of G. such that the following three conditions are satisfied. Number one, H and K have to be normal. They're normal subgroups of G. So we didn't actually manually check that in the last video where we talked about the units mod 15 because the units mod 15 were abelian and it's a given that every subgroup is gonna be normal. But in general, we might need to check that more carefully. Number two, the intersection of H and K is trivial. We know that the intersection of H and K, because it's an intersection of two subgroups, it's gonna be a subgroup of G. We want it to be the trivial subgroup. And those are actually the only two conditions required for G to contain an internal direct product of H and K. However, we can further say G is an internal direct product of H and K or H times K if the following additional condition is satisfied in addition to the first two. And that third condition is that H times K, the set consisting of anything from H times anything from K that product is equal to all of G. Okay, so G can contain an internal direct product or it can be the internal direct product. It is the internal direct product if G consists only of products of elements of H and elements of K and nothing else. But sometimes you'll see H and K inside of G and you'll see a, an internal direct product of H and K inside of G and G will contain some other stuff that's not accounted for here. So I wanna leave that possibility open. This is a little bit more elaborate definition than, than what's given in the book because it allows for that possibility that G might not be the internal direct product of H and K, but it might contain an internal direct product. Okay, by the way, you may be wondering about the terminology. We've defined external direct product and we've defined internal direct product. In terms of group structure, external and internal direct products are the same. What is different is how we arrive at them. An external direct product is obtained by taking two groups, taking any two groups that we want, and we could just totally pick things at random. We could say Z7 and S3, an abelian group and a non-abelian group. Uh, not that we have to choose one of each, we could choose two non-abelian, we could choose two abelian, whatever. Uh, and we take the direct product of those by just forming ordered pairs and defining a group operation on ordered pairs. And the group operation is do a Z7 operation, then do an S3 operation. That's an external direct product. It's a direct product that comes from taking groups in the outside world and jamming them together. An internal direct product And we have an example from the last video. It was, uh, it was the units mod 15. And we said, well, U15 really was the internal direct product of the subgroup generated by two and the subgroup generated by 11. So here we're getting a direct product by taking a group that, whose structure we're interested in and finding two factors or two groups inside of that group and then observing that the group is a direct product of those. So we're finding direct products from within a group. Uh, the terminology external versus internal is not the most important aspect of this lesson. I just want you to be aware of the distinction and how we're constructing things. Okay, so now the thing that I want to do in this video is we, we've defined what it means to have an internal direct product. But I want to show that actually if we have an internal direct product, then what we see there really is a direct product. I mean, it, it has all the same group structure as an external direct product as we defined in the previous videos. 
So let's move this over. I want to have this on screen, but not totally in the way here. So let's just move the title out there. We still got the definition. So here's the theorem we're going to prove. We're going to prove the following thing. If G is a group and G contains an internal direct product H times K, so we're assuming that H and K are both normal subgroups of G and satisfy the intersection condition. So if G contains an internal direct product, then HK, first of all, that is a group, and it is actually isomorphic to what we would think of as the external direct product of H cross K. Now, here a bit of clarification is needed because I've been using this symbol, the time symbol, to represent both internal and external direct products. Uh, this one's internal, this one's external. So what I'm saying here specifically is the subset or the subgroup HK is going to be isomorphic to the external direct product H cross K, the one that actually consists of ordered pairs of things and has the ordered pair operation. That's what we're going to prove. Okay, so here's the proof. We're going to prove this by first showing that HK really is a group, and in fact, it's a subgroup of G. And then we're going to develop an isomorphism from the external direct product to this subgroup HK. We're going to show those are isomorphic. All right, so uh, how shall we begin? Well, let's show HK is a subgroup of G. Let's start there. Okay, to do that, let's show it satisfies the closure property and the inverse property and also has the identity. Uh, the fact that it has the identity is not going to be too bad. Uh, we know HK has the identity. Since we can always write the identity of G is equal to the identity of G times the identity of G, and that belongs to H and that belongs to K. So this belongs to HK. No problem there, but for closure, well, for closure, I'm going to assume that X and Y belong to HK. And we'll show X times Y belongs to HK. This one's a little bit tricky. We have to use the fact that H and K are normal. Otherwise, there's no way to prove this because it's not true in general uh, that H times K is a subgroup. Only when we know something special like the fact H and K are normal. Okay, uh, well, because X and Y are in HK, we know X and Y are each expressible as something in H times something in k. So let's say that x is equal to hk times uh, hx times kx, y is equal to hy ky. For some, let's make sure and quantify this, for some hx hy belong to h and some kx ky belonging to k. All right, so that we have. Okay, so now xy is just going to be all those little factors jammed together. So Ajax Kx times Hy Ky. And now I'm going to use a strategy similar to what we've used in other videos before, uh, where we had to work with left cosets and right cosets and show they were the same when certain normality conditions were satisfied. So we've got this product, this little piece of the pie here, this Kx times Hy. We know that that belongs to Kx times h. That belongs to that left coset, which means that the left coset kx h, because h is normal, that's going to be the same as h kx. Okay, and because we know that kx hy belongs to this right coset, we know that kx hy can be written as an element of this right coset. Well, that right coset consists of things of the form H prime KX, and H prime may be different from HY. Okay, but I know that I can write this whole thing as HX times H prime KX KY. Okay, and you may think, oh man, we've given up something by changing the HY to H prime, but remember, we're just trying to show 
that this element is something in H times something in K. And I think we're there now. So let's move over a bit. So that means that this is an element of, I think I can say that's an element of HK. So that means HK is closed under the group operation. Yes. Uh, now, one thing you'll notice there is I only used the fact that H was normal. I didn't use the fact that K was normal. So you may wonder, do we really need the fact that K is normal? I think we're going to use it later, but we'll see. Okay, so uh, what's next? Next up, we need to show that HK contains inverses. So let's suppose X belongs to HK. Okay, then X is equal to HK for some H in H and some K in K. And I'm only using, I'm not using subscript this time because I only have the X. I don't need to distinguish between an X and a Y. Okay, well then X inverse by the sock shoes principle is going to be K inverse, H inverse. And we know H inverse belongs to H since H is a subgroup. So X inverse does belong to K inverse H. Okay, but again, we know that H is normal. So X inverse also can be said to belong to H K inverse because those left coset and right coset, those are the same. Okay, uh, so what does that mean? So X inverse is equal to H prime K inverse for some H prime belonging to H. And again, that may be a different H prime than the H that we had earlier. Uh, we may have to trade out switching the order of H and K for changing which element of H uh, we, we are using here. Okay, but now we know H prime belongs to H and K inverse belongs to K. So X inverse belongs to HK because it's written as an element of H right here times an element of K right here. So that means HK is closed under inverse as well. So at this point we've shown, now we know HK is a subgroup, yay. And actually to get that, we only needed the fact that H was normal. We didn't need the fact that K was normal. So you may be wondering, where is that going to come in? Where are we going to use the fact that K is normal? And you will see in the next video where we prove that there is an isomorphism.